All right. Hello, everyone. We are here today for a discussion of Senlin Ascends. This is book one in the books of Babel. Look at all the books coming up here. <laughs> book one in the books of Babel by Josiah Bancroft. We already had a bit of a contest here. So Ben and I have just ordinary old copies, but you guys want to show off your your art? I have a signed yeah. book plate with a quote yeah. from the author. The Library of oh, Vikings. So he's got a quote. I don't have a quote. signed <laughs> book plate with a quote, and Alan has the autographed copy. So no quote. Ben, mm. I guess we've been uh, outmatched there. Yeah, I'm know. used to it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So as you can see, for my guest for this discussion, we have uh, overly average Ben here. And it's just gonna call you Ben for the discussion. <laughs> I, not I go by uh, I go by average usually, but <laughs> okay, you go by your middle name. Okay. okay. <laughs> and we have two libraries with us, so I feel like it's the clash of the libraries. We have the Library of Alexandria going with the Greco-Roman theme, and that's of course Alan. Yeah. Hello, Alan. And it, it's only a clash if Johan didn't like the book. Like, if he didn't like it, then it's a clash. If he liked it, then we are we are in alliance. Oh, I figure it's a clash Ooh. because you you Ooh. already don't like Vikings. And yeah. he is, of course, library oh. of a Viking. My my age had passed by the time of the rise of the Viking. So we're, uh. we, we're not actually clashing historically <laughs> either. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. So Johan is here from Library of Viking. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you for having me. Awesome. It's great to see all three of you. And uh, Grace Dion was going to be with us, unfortunately. She's a bit under the weather, but we are very much hoping she'll be joining us for future discussions of the Books of Babel, which we will be continuing on other channels. We haven't decided yet who's going to handle the next book, but uh, we'll figure that out and announce it. So do the Brits say Books of Babel? Do y'all say Books of Babel? Yeah, I don't. Babel, no, I, I, I said the Brits. Oh, yeah, you're you asking Brits. Babel. We say Babel. Babel. It's Babel, Philip. We're right. Okay. <laughs> I figure it's one of those, you know, friendly. We arguments. threw off the shackles yeah. of their oppression 300 years ago. So yeah. it's, it's I mean, we, we walk on sidewalks over here and they walk on, what do you walk on? Pavement. Path. Pavement. Path. Yeah. Spell okay. your path. Pavement and path. Nice. Yeah. They spell color with a U. I mean, mm. no, they have all these extra letters in their, in their words. So. And we drink tea, which I'm actually drinking right now. So there yeah. you go. What if I oh, was nice. drinking tea right now, Yo? Fantasy. I would have, <laughs> what if this was tea? It's, it's coffee, but it could have been tea. My wife drinks tea. Oh, I drink tea too. But anyway, we are going to discuss this. First, I want to get general impressions of San Lin Ascends from the three mm -hmm. of you. Uh, non spoiler for a bit, in case there's people here who will just want to get an impression of the book. We are going to, after those general impressions, get into the spoilers so ben let's start with you what are your you released a review of course of it on your channel recently but what are your just what do you want to say about it in, in a general non-spoiler way uh in, in a general non-spoiler way um i think i'll probably end up being the most mixed probably from the like uh the group because i <laughs> I, I i it's very hard to do this with alan staring it's uh <laughs> usually easier to record a video and run away but um I, I really love elements of the book. Um, the, the writing is uh, probably some of the best poetic uh, writing I've read in any fantasy book. Um, and is kind of, it, even for me, is rivaling like a hob in terms of how evocative the imagery is and how, um, how deeply it pulls me in. Um, and, and it really helps that for some bits where I was a bit distanced in terms of... Um, like feeling unsure about where I was going in the story, um, that the writing was exceptional. And so that really kept me going throughout. Um, otherwise, I think the, I would mainly say that in the big positive are, are set pieces. Um, this book has like a few real big set pieces that uh, kind of throughout the book keep the pace moving and really climax in, in small ways to... Um, it makes it a very quick read despite having what um, people would kind of see when you hear poetic prose you think it's going to be a, a slower process but it's actually an extremely accessible and fast read despite the, the prose excellent excellent and we'll address some of those uh, 
critiques that uh, you had in mind that probably will require some spoilers. Um, so <laughs> I can just see. I it's that was a be, very diplomatic start. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting discussion. I think the word, like you said, Ben, the word appreciate might come up here and there. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and I think, okay, with that, we are going to move on to uh, the, um, the person who is, uh, I think, responsible for a lot of us, for certainly me, we're picking up this series, and that would be Alan, who oh, next, okay. I think it's fair to say, Alan, that you are an enthusiastic uh, fan of the Books of Babel. Is that uh, is that the case? So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the first new series I discovered on BookTube, and so it has a special place, like, like you know, in a, in because back to fantasy. I hadn't read fantasy in a long time, and I'd been reading Malazan, um, and that's what I was reading like when I first started. Uh, booktube and i let my wife pick a book of like i'm like hair of these books pick one that you want me to read this month and i read it was sinless sins and i loved it i loved it because one i hadn't read a ton of fantasy and it was just something like completely new and i am a big fan as um i had a theater director once because i you know whatever who said you're these are these are um real people responding in imaginary circumstances and that is what sinless sense felt like like it was so refreshing to see like, hey, this is us. And so when people, you know, mo people hate someone. They think he's boring. Anything nothing happens, they think he's boring. And I hear it all the time. It's like, okay, you do better. Go, go on. You do better. I'm sure you wouldn't have lost Maria. Like, I'm sure you wouldn't. I'm sure you would have continued. Like, he's a schmuck. And every one of us in that situation would have sucked butt just like, sorry, sorry for the, the colorful language um, on Philip's channel. <laughs> um, like, like we would not have done any better, but I love his evolution to more world weary and everyone hates that he's so naive. Yes, he's naive. I'm sorry. Are you robbed by everybody on the daily basis? Do you walk around being like, hmm, what are you trying to get from me? Some of us do, but like he's from a backwoods town where everybody knows everybody. And I mean, I, I can't. And again, I'm, I'm straw manning right now. I'm defending a bunch of stuff that isn't actually happening. But I like that he's a teacher. I love that he's a, he's a teacher and that he is so reliant on his intellect. Like he's like, I know things. I teach things. I should know what's happening. But he doesn't because he's a, he's a, he's a mook. Um, they call him feckless and gormless. And that's the best description of Senlin. Like he's, he, he is, he's arrogant and he thinks he knows better and he does not in any way know better but i love that he comes to know better um or at least a little bit and also maria i'm attached to maria in this book because she reminds me of my wife who i also bring a book to parties when oh, she and, plays the piano huh? yeah i also bring a book to parties and would like would love for people to leave me alone while i'm reading a book ah. and my wife is wonderfully uh social she talks to everybody and she'll talk to everybody about everything like about i'm like i don't care like i don't i i, I just don't care so i'm just gonna read or talk to people i know but my wife will play the piano and she's the life of the party like everyone loves my wife we, so we all that, know that christina is much nicer than you are 100 yeah, and, <laughs> and and you know i'm 10 years older than my wife so you know she you know it's it's not quite the send maria thing which is a little weird <laughs> um a little weird um i ne i never taught my wife at school <laughs> uh, but, um, but I mean, I am, I am 10 years older than Christina. So, so there's a lot of like, you know, you impose yourself on there and I'm not quite as, I don't think I'm quite as, I'm quite a big of a dunce as, as Senlin. But again, like you said, Ben, the prose, I loved how it was, had this like classic, like, um, you know, kind of fairy tale, like quality, like Alice in Wonderland, like quality, but it didn't bog you down. Like hmm. usually in like, like you said, like purple or prose, I get, I, I struggle to get through those fast, but this didn't. And I love the juxtaposition between this like fanciful prose and someone being murdered right next to Senlin. And it just gives it this really dissonant quality that is spookier to me than if it had been like, oh yeah, and then his gut splattered on the ground and everything was dark and oh, and people scream. And instead it's like, oh, and then all of a sudden his guts burst from his, burst <laughs> from his chest, uh, throwing uh, throwing blood on Sendon's face. And he was aghast. Like, I'm just like, how are you not focusing on the fact this guy was just murdered? And I don't even know if that's what happens in the book, but you know what I'm talking about? Like situations like that, right. where it's really, 
just this bizarre just just juxtapositions. And so I liked it. I liked it because of those reasons. But I do completely understand when people are like, yeah, it's boring. <laughs> uh, I tend to read a lot of those books where people are like, yeah, it's boring. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like Long Price Quartet, anything by KJ Parker, Senlin. So uh, Arm of the Sphinx is slightly less boring, if that makes anybody feel better. Ben knows. Yeah. All right. Wow, yeah, cool. Uh, uh, Arm of the Sphinx is a, a, a much uh, more crowd-pleasing book, I think. Um, Pacier. And there's more Edith. I love Edith. All right. All Ooh. right. All right. So uh, and that leaves Johan to give us his non-spoiler impressions before we move into the specifics and our what we like, didn't like. And we can be as spoilery as we want. So, Johan, what did you think of the book? I'm very curious. Yeah. So I've had this series on my TBR for maybe two years. I actually heard it from Captured in Words first, uh, not from Alan. Yeah. Um, so I've been wanting to read this for a while because I love when fan when someone brings something new to the fantasy genre. Um, and I've heard that this series is quite unique and weird. And being a huge Dark Tower fan, I really hope that this would bring something new, something weird to the table. And it was definitely weird. It was definitely unique. But it was also a bit different from what I expected. Um, I didn't expect it to be this plot driven. I would definitely call this a plot driven fantasy. Mm. Um, and I mean, I do agree with both of you. The prose is absolutely beautiful and um, which really helped me to get immersed in the story. Um, overall, I probably would give this four stars out of five. It's definitely good. I would recommend it. And I will definitely be continuing the series. I suppose my biggest issues, and we can talk more about this later on, uh, but that was really with the character work. Um, and I do blame Robin Hop here because I literally had read Fool's Errand and then I picked up this book and I was just like, there's so much trauma <laughs> in this book. And Josiah Bancroft, he doesn't analyze it at all. While well, Robin Hop, she'll spend 500 pages on a single trauma event. Um, so yeah, I do kind of blame going, don't read Robin Hop and then go straight to this book. But otherwise I was overall positive on it. The yeah, book's I, only 355 pages, Johan. I definitely hope no one ever reads my book after reading a Robin Hobb book. <laughs> Mine is 389. Oh, oh okay. Well, that's close. Maybe it's the UK well, one. I think UK. Yeah, no, mine is two. Oh, mine is, mine is two. I don't know anything. <laughs> it just reads so fast. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I, I just hope no one reads your book. Philip, period. Like not after Robin Hobb. Or <laughs> I don't know what reads it. Well, you already read it. So I did, and I should be the last. <laughs> that's, that's my fondest, that's my fondest wish. And no one should definitely listen to the audio. It's gonna be trash. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a I'm just point. kidding. Everyone should read Philip's book. All right. Well, we'll see about that. But uh yeah, so cool. I, I this is really uh, good to hear you guys, your general thoughts. Just to share, I mean, I can't. Uh, really add anything in terms of the pros it's been praised and I think it deserves all of it I think I agree with Bancroft's uh, skill as a writer uh, I think he's succeeds in in that tricky balance of being accessible and yet coming off with some beautiful sentences at the same time and some uh, just uh, gorgeous descriptions I I like Alan found myself very much identifying with the main character, the flaws, uh, as, as well as the, the quirks and the, and the more lovable parts of, uh, Thomas Senlin. And I also liked a lot of the secondary characters and the concept itself. I think maybe my favorite thing of all is just the basic concept of this, which, you know, the idea of taking, the Tower of Babel, you know, I, you're all familiar with the story from Genesis of the Tower of Babel, which is an interesting starting point. Maybe we can start with that for our discussion. And it's even in the land of Ur. Yeah, yeah. So he'll take, mm -hmm. take place names that are, are biblical. But it feels to me like what he's done is taken uh, a, a kind of theoretical, well, what if the Tower of Babel happened, but... God never punished all the people and made them all scatter away with different languages because everybody speaks the same language here. Mm -hmm. Although there seems to be a lot of different cultures in the Tower of Babel, everything's all mishmashed together. It feels like like everybody, you don't necessarily know where they're from. Although some people are born in the tower and that sort of thing, but it's this place that seems a mishmash if we can describe it without spoilers, I guess. 
of various cultures that are maybe in part, like you could say that Thomas Sandlin seems to be very British, right? I mean, he's, he just, he's even, sorry, sorry, Ben. Uh, but he definitely, so, right. he definitely is. <laughs> yeah. Definitely he, he feels very British, uh, although he's not British. There's no, there's no UK or Britain in here. Um, and, and just like with the other cultures. Um, so there's some real world basis, I guess, but it's a completely fantastical setting mm -hmm. where Bancroft seems to have just taken everything and thrown it into a kind of a, uh, uh, it feels kind of 19th century ish, I guess, uh, maybe, um, steampunk kind of vibe. I, uh, would you guys call it steampunk? Uh, I would. I yeah, would yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. So we're going with steampunk. Uh, but yeah, just all that thrown together. I think it's just the concept of it and having the, the premise of the story being, Oops, Alan's battery is dead. Oh no. <laughs> ben, now is your chance to say everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so just the concept though, he'll he'll be back. Uh the concept of the whole thing is just incredible to me and very bold, I think. Mm. Just the idea that someone could write an entire book, never mind four books, with the mm. concept of ascending this tower. I mean, it's just it's kind of, I admire that a lot. So, but, uh, so yeah, let's, I guess, uh, get into, uh, some of the spoilers now. Uh, so I don't know if you had specific things you guys wanted to talk about or we, Ben, we could begin if you want. I, I mean, it would be kind of funny to do it without Alan here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to start with negatives, um, because I okay. do think the book is an overall positive experience. I was going to mention, um, you mentioned side characters. Yes. Um, and I do think that side characters are like we've spoken about pros. I think the next strongest positive are the side characters for me. Yeah. Um, I do also want to mention because you were mentioning place names. I don't know whether anyone else called it this, um, but the the place where Senlin's from, if you were pronouncing it in like England, it would be Eyesore. And I think Eyesore is an extremely funny name. Like, because I don't, I think people were pronounce it like Eyesaw or something. I don't know. Right. But people, it, it, the A U G H would be like Eyesore in the UK. Um, and I think that's a, a funny little touch as well. But um, for uh, the, like, uh, I think Alan mentioned Edith. Uh, in terms of the side characters, they were all the best part of the book for me. Every mm -hmm. single person that was introduced felt fully realized. And even though they're in such a small part, they they created the the kind of canvas of what um what Senlin was like Senlin was Senlin, sorry, um and I think that's probably why some people find Senlin so boring because he's interacting with people in this book who are far more interesting than him at this point, yeah. Um, and I didn't have a problem with Senlin, <laughs> but I really appreciated that. Uh, like Edith was amazing. Like the parlor mm -hmm. scene was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I, I would agree with that. Uh, the moments emotions were evoked was usually when side characters were present, and the pronounced tar Taru, the the other friend he he gets. I also yes. loved him. Um, there just seems to be an emotional depth when with the side characters, but not so much with Senlin, which I found a bit baffling at times. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with Ben. The, the side characters were really really great, and and hopefully we get to know Senlin a bit more in book two. Yeah. I'm sure we will. He's getting to know himself, I think, mm, yeah. in some big ways. In some ways, to me, it seems like the tower itself functions as a, a, a giant metaphor and mm. as, as a place where people go. And Sandlin has this notion of it, a very naive notion of the tower. He comes as a tourist and doesn't really, he's, he's I mean, very appropriately, his notion of what the tower is comes from a book. And that tells you just how bookish this guy is <laughs> and how he knows more about what's in the book than he knows about what's in the real world. And so that naivete is so central to who he is. Uh, but do you guys think that's a valid observation that the tower serves as a, and, and a good symbol, of course, has a lot of different meanings, has a lot of different interpretations. How did you take the tower? What, did, mm. what does the tower mean to you in, in, in your reading? Ben, do you want to tackle that question? I feel like um, it's a difficult question because you were saying there are so many viewpoints to take that um, 
for me, it felt like a, it, it, it pointed out the, um, the hubris of Senlin for me. It's the kind of, um, you, he feels like he is knowledgeable in this place that he's from. And then he reaches an unfathomably, like you, it comprehends how small and insignificant he is, um, in terms of reaching it. And I think that that's my main takeaway from the, the tower is that sense of, um, insignificance for him on a personal level. Yeah. Uh, that he'd never kind of faced before in a cultural way. Yeah, and it's vast. It's this huge, vast thing that you have no idea of the scale and and, and the, the impact that it's going to have on you when you're standing. I mean, if you look at it from a distance, it looks like a little needle up in the sky. As you get closer and closer, it's just a huge thing. I felt that way sometimes in, in New York City, looking up at some of the bigger buildings, you know, uh, and this thing is, of course, much, much vaster in the imagination than that and much more ancient. It's, it's mysterious, right? They don't really clearly know where it came from. So it has mysterious origins. Um, there's a lot of mystery to this and, and how it got to be what it is and the different layers of it as well which um, there seems to be a, a definite hierarchy to it. All the dross is down there <laughs> in the basement. Yeah. Um, and as you make your way up, each level seems to be also symbolic in itself mm. too, I think. We could talk about the various levels, but first let's get Johan's impression of the tower as a whole. What, what, uh, what did it suggest to you? Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting question because um, when I was reading about this tower, one thing I found really fascinating is that a bit similar to other fantasy worlds where, where you enter it and you feel this sense of awe because it's so vast, it's so epic. I also did feel that with the tower, which is quite interesting when you think about it. It's just a tower, but it just felt like it was infinite, um, both upwards, but also each level felt huge and massive. But one thing that really stuck out to me is it seems like some some of the more negative elements of human nature were highlighted in the Tower of Babel, like people seem to be more self-focused and more prideful. And there was this element of almost survival of the fittest. As soon as you were in the tower, um, no one would actually care about you, um, which I found quite interesting, but also quite scary because you just, you never knew what was going to happen to Senlin. And as we know later on, he got stuck in a job with crap pay for months and months and, and months um, with basically no rights. So... That's what really stuck out. Yeah, stuck out to me. Um, That's really well said, actually. And I also think I maybe would even add the idea of self-delusion. Like yeah. one of the things that seems so evident in the tower is how good people are at deluding themselves. Yeah. I mean, the the entire. I mean, and Senlin is of course Exhibit A. Uh, of course, even before he arrives at the tower, he's he's living in a very naive. Uh, uh, view of the world, but uh, I think the parlor in particular is interesting in that regard and how people like to play roles. We play roles in our lives, mm. don't we? And uh, sometimes <laughs> we get carried away in those roles and, and you wonder, you strip away this layer of of acting, you st strip away this mask and what's under that mask, maybe another mask. And how many mm. masks do you have to strip away before you get to something authentic? It was that moment in in the parlor when the one guy uh, Sandlin realizes that uh, he's actually an actor as well. He thinks he's like a clerk who works yeah. there, yeah, and yeah. then he realized, oh wait, he's he's an actor too. This whole yeah. I've been put out in this cage by somebody who's acting a role, and you realize the whole yeah. thing is a giant fraud that we're all running around being frauds all the time. Yeah. So what did you think of that, Ben? Uh, I, I thought the parlor to me was the highlight of the book. Um, I think mm. that is the most fascinating segment. And um, I, I read it all in one sitting. I could not put the parlor down. Um, not the beer me go round? That wasn't the best part? <laughs> well, the beer me go round was pretty good. But, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, the um, one thing I also liked about that is that there's also, because the clerk, the idea of always oh, the clerk and act, like the fact that they are an actor, um, it even made me question at the start where I'm like, was was Edith an actor? Like mm. she could have easily have been an actor as well. And it left that question like dangling for later in the book that I thought that was really well done where um, 
like it, it, it adds that sense of uh, it, it builds in that sense of unreliability to every character you now meet and you're kind of predisposed to distrust some people yeah. um, that I think does a great job of uh, being a kind of thesis statement for where we're going with the characters we meet um, yeah. is just the, the, the concept of um, you have to now you have to assume the worst in the Tower of Babel. Yeah, yeah, mm. cool. Any thoughts on that, you know, on, on self-delusion or what was going on in the parlor, all the acting and what it brought out in the actors? I mean, some of that was pretty scary stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, I suppose that probably wasn't my favorite part of the book, but what what that really said for me is that it just, it just made the Tower of Babel even weirder. And it really left you wondering, like, how does this work? And why, how was this set in place? Um, and just gave me lots and lots of, lots of questions, which really helped me to want to continue to the end because you just have so, so many questions about everything. Um, and it just seems so weird, like how everything works together um, and still also doesn't work together um, somehow. But we're actually skipping ahead a little bit. I mean, before we even get into the tower, stuff happens in the mm. market. That's where Senlin le loses Mario. Yeah. And you just see the the extent of his naivete, but also his arrogance, because he's looking at these women who are tied together and he's kind of being a jerk. He's been patronizing about it. Oh, you have to tie each other. To, you know. And then, little does he know he's already lost his his mm. wife. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that's that's a pretty like he keeps having these revelations. He keeps having these epiphanies, doesn't mm. he? Yeah, and also because he goes there on a honeymoon, so this is supposed to be a really wondrous time, obviously, but yeah. when he loses Mario, he goes to this wall where people have left messages for people that they have lost in the tower, yeah. and like some of these have been gone for 18 years, 20 years, um, and you start to realize, actually, the Tower of Babel is not heaven on earth um, in some ways, but it more seems almost like an endless hell, I suppose you could call it. Um, and it was really scary. Like, yeah, it, it felt scary to know that people have been searching for their spouse in this tower for 20 years. <laughs> like, what is going on here? I mean, if, when you were a kid, were you ever in a like a shopping mall or something, and with your with your parent, or with yeah. your mother or something, and then you got interested in something, you wandered off, and you realized suddenly you were alone. Mm. Yeah, that, th this brought me back to that <laughs> that awful. Yeah, you know, feeling of abandonment and, and fear, yeah. and and it was is it really potent? I thought. What, what did you think about it, Ben? There's a um, yeah, it it, it builds a scale, um, like the idea of the eighteen years, and like it, it builds a scale and severity to it that you, it has that childlike quality of it makes you relate to send them feeling like a child in that moment of being alone and being lost, but also has the severity of like a very adult situation of like this is life affecting. I think it balances well where it has um, the kind of the consequences of an adult, but the, the childlike feeling of uh, like the mm. loss of innocence for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, mm. Like, like the scene, th that scene where he goes to the, um, the wall and uh, like, there's the, the, the crash that was genuinely terrifying. Like reading that I was uh, like, it was what Alan was describing where it's kind of this very poetical description of, what is a harrowing and very just terrifying situation that re that has that that dissonance for the reader where you are you feel very jarred i felt in that moment yeah yeah plus i think one touch that i really admire was the fact that senlin tries to find maria by buying a whole lot of lingerie and women's underwear. <laughs> and he's, he's running around with all of this women's underwear. And then the, the scene where he finally does get into the basement and uh, he is uh, approached by Finn, Finn Goal. And yeah. when he gets him to go on the beer me go round and finally he just loses all the underwear <laughs> and it goes all over the place. I mean, it's a pretty brilliant touch, I thought, right? There's some good comedy in here, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, in a lot of ways, this felt almost like a whimsical... It had that whimsical tone in parts, definitely. Um, but we're also talking about something very serious, like someone has lost his wife in the tower. Um, yeah. One thing about the tower as well that also quite scared me, and it's right from the beginning when he loses his wife, is that it just it doesn't seem like... It just seems like anarchy in a lot of ways. Yeah. People don't have rights. 
the wife is gone and no one cares. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just off to him. He's totally alone in this whole situation. And um, that also just, yeah, quite scared me. Like the human nature seemed to be really highlighted, like the the bad part of the human nature in the tower. Yeah, you, you hurt us all together in a dense enough place and we start, you know, just getting back to our, our primal urges, I guess, right, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, that that is there's an it's an instantaneous quality in that where it's like it, there's no sense of like you don't feel like that he's losing her she's just lost like mm. it is it's one moment to the next just got and and he's she's gone before he even realizes like it's it's not that he um he knows that she's gone it is that you're with him in that moment of where he's like oh she's been gone for a while. Like and I've just been standing here. She's she's gone, and uh, that that is terrifying as well. The feeling that you, he, that feeling of being behind already, you didn't mm. even realize that something had started, and you're already losing, and you're already behind. Yeah, um, yeah. it is terrifying in that that opening. Mm. Yeah. And that that just gets worse throughout the whole book. Like the <laughs> more we learn about the tower, and the more he knows, like she could have ended here or here or here. I mean, none of the scenarios are good. <laughs> for yeah. mario i see did you ever catch yourself thinking oh if only they had cell phones yes <laughs> or a police or something, <laughs> or something. <laughs> some kind of authority <laughs> yeah, but, some kind of authority but so he does make it into the basement i thought the the incident in the skirts was also very eye-opening when you had that uh, balloon that splat you know fell on the ground and all these people come to pillage the remains and almost to the extent that they're like vultures that just descend on this and then yeah. suddenly everything is gone and Senlin is just watching in shock the whole time. You know, yeah. apparently <laughs> when he learns, he's been wondering, well, you just see how so naive. Why is there no one up close to the tower? You know, and then suddenly, mm. boom, he gets, it's like a metaphor for the entire experience. He suddenly gets these big, rude awakenings uh that uh keep shocking him out of his his little uh naive world there um but then he makes it into the basement which is really the dregs of humanity uh isn't it in some sense hmm. yeah definitely so when we get into the basement we meet a couple as it turns out i mean by then you've already met adam Hello. Can y'all hear me? Um, yeah. yeah, we can hear you, hey, Alan. We back. can't see you yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't find, and I'm crippled. So the oh, uh, yeah. the looking around of my house, I cannot find my other battery. My ca my camera was plugged in, but I keep forgetting to turn it off, just like my mic. And I do not know where my other camera battery is or my battery charger. But I do have a USB mic, okay. so I've given up. So well, this is the best I can, can do. You can talk, so that's the main thing. So um, we will. <laughs> We'll pretend that you're locked in a room somewhere in the basement. Cool. I missed I missed a bunch of the discourse, so I apologize if I repeat anything because I've been. Oh, not to worry, here. not to worry. We were just talking about the very so we we gone through the market where Senlin lost Maria, and we've basically gotten through the skirts. We're about to talk about Adam and <sighs> the uh, the tragedy of poor Adam. I th I felt so bad for this. Poor character. You feel bad for Adam? I do feel bad for Adam. I mean, Philip, he's... No. <laughs> okay, I mean... All right, I you mean, tell me... He definitely... Yeah, we... He... Tell me your Adam thoughts. Adam Boreas. He, uh, he rips off Senlin. I, I dislike Adam. And then he does it again. Or he's trying to do it again. Or he rats him out to red hand. Well, if he didn't do it, someone else definitely would have. Oh, I mean... well, okay, well, that's a great philosophy, Philip. <laughs> 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 Alan, can you you can see us, right? I can see y'all. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, good. You can see me. Uh, this is actually really fun. I love this that <laughs> the, we're talking. Voice from the darkness. Yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> yeah. this is this is fantastic. I didn't. I did not like it <laughs> in this first book, but I am less forgiving than most people, and mostly because Adam, I'm a Sinland fan, and so yeah. Adam screwed Sinland over twice. Therefore, Adam is the worst. Mm -hmm. Um. But, but do you blame him though? I mean, he's I been, he's, he's in this no. meat grinder of a tower mm -hmm. where it's, you know, either you do it or you get killed. It's like driving in New Jersey. If you sit there and and the cars are going by, you're never going to get in traffic. You have to get out in traffic. You have to go for it to cut off somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how it is for poor Adam. Isn't I mean, it? I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that is true. The, the, the tower is a harsh mistress. 
um, as I said, in pretty much every review of, of the books um, that I did. Um, yeah, I get, I do get it. And Fengal is, Fengal himself is part of the system. Uh, and so Fengal's terrible too, but he's also, if he doesn't do it, someone else will. Um, and the, as we've seen the fate for people who, um, you either die or they, you know, I don't know, you don't, you certainly don't want to be a hod, which is the, yeah. the, you know, the, the slave class. Right. Um, I really liked, we're not there yet. And I heard y'all talk about the parlor briefly. I thought the parlor was just so bizarre, but I love the parlor. I mean, I don't want to be there, but (laughs) (laughs) it Um, does seem though that we're getting an introduction to a, a a counter philosophy to this do or die. That's uh, yeah. And which is it coming in, in the form of, uh, believe it or not, Senlin himself. That's my favorite part of Senlin is the fact that. Right. Right refuses to become what the tower is trying to make him yeah uh, meet so many people who have been ground down by the tower and senlin doesn't want to be that guy and right. because of that he gets screwed over now i love the last part where he's fingal's uh you know his foreman because you see that he's found a way to play by the tower's rules without compromising who he is is his inherent like yeah virtue that he carries and that's why i really like senlin is because he 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 does wise up a little bit and he does he realizes that okay so the system's going to grind me down if i don't change something how can i stay inherently tom with but also within the system of the tower and mm-hmm. that's and that's what like I love when he tried when he offers to teach Iren to read, um, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that he still trusts Adam, even though he knows he should not like he knows that, but he doesn't want to be the person that trusts nobody like he doesn't yeah. want to be that guy. So that's why I admire Senlin, Senlin's ability, because I think we as people struggle really hard to not give in to what the culture dictates that we should be, um, because I mean, I don't, I don't know how UK culture is, but American culture is very, very me, 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 care about me, not about other people. And Senlin doesn't want to be that guy. Like he doesn't want to be like, well, I'm gonna get mine, and whoever I screw over on the way, well, suck it. And so I, um, I, I like, I like that in Senlin. Yeah, it's beautiful. Actually, it's really beautiful. I love how he keeps insisting that friendship and and loyalty are real and that he can just believe these people into being his friends and that they'll eventually live up to his his belief uh so what did you think of that ben about that aspect of his character yeah i i do think i think adam elevates senlin um because like adam has to exist to juxtapose uh senlin in the sense of they are in similar predicaments of having um, so a uh, uh, kind of a woman in their life that is subjugated or lost or, or in a bad situation and um, yeah and that we see Adam who's constantly grinded down by it and then I, I think it's the it's kind of like a, I think Senlin and Adam is a Frodo and Gollum type situation where mm. it's like I have to believe in you um, because if I don't then I've lost myself type thing. Mm. Um, and I, I really appreciate that relationship. And then, uh, so yeah, I think Adam elevates Senlin as a result. Um, and then I was trying to think of- That's great. Uh, That's really well said. I love that. Mm. Yep. I mean, uh, one thing that I found quite interesting is that the tower is so brut- brutal. It's so ruthless. Um, and it's it's highlighting a lot of the bad aspects of human nature. Um, yeah. And Senlin, he just seems to be quite pure, quite naive. Um, I suppose one, I'm not sure if, it, if I would even call it a criticism, but it left me wondering, how is he able to stay so pure for so long? Like you would ex- expect him to have more trauma or grief um, or just have a broken spirit, but yeah. he just seems to keep having that will to go on. Um, yeah. And I, maybe I, I would... I wanted to see a bit more of that, those feelings being highlighted a bit more Um, because he doesn't seem to be awfully sad about his wife being gone. I mean, he he is sad, 
but we don't hear much about his inner thoughts, his inner struggles. Um, he he seems to be almost overly naive um, in some parts. I uh, think it might be because he's such an introvert too, though. Mm. That's yeah, his, that's like his point. his reaction to this whole thing is a very introverted reaction. Mm. It's like, oh, oh no, um, what do I do? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I I think he's he I, I I feel like I could see myself doing something similar, just like being stunned and and I'm, maybe I should think about this for a while, you know, and and then slowly realizing the emotional impact and and. Mm. and cogitating on that for yeah. for quite a while rather than reacting emotively right away um i thought that it was really some of his humanity did come out in the relationship with edith which yeah. i thought was really well done and interesting and there was obviously you know they're thrown into a horrible situation where their lives are in danger and they're, they're because this crazy guy is taking his role a little too far uh, and <laughs> i really think that it's um it's another great statement about humanity though, this whole part in the parlor, but I love what develops between Senlin and Edith. And, and also even, I feel like it's so compelling how Senlin is torn because I feel like he is a little guilty, a little attracted to Edith in, on some level. I mean, he's not unfaithful to Maria. Obviously he's, he's doing whatever he can to get to her, but, but he connects with Edith in a way uh, while they're in this cage together, particularly. And there's, that's a bond. That's an experience that they have as a result of that. And I, I, I really felt for him in that situation where she had been branded and he has to decide, do I stay by her now or yeah. do I leave? Most people would have left a long time ago. Like yeah. most people would have been like, Oh geez, sorry, Edith. Bye. You know, yeah. Yeah. as soon as the guy rendered the verdict. So what did you guys think of the relationship between Senlin and Edith? I um, love and Alan, you're back. You, why don't you go Senlin. first? Um, yeah, I love Senlin and Edith. Uh, and um, in this, like, I love Edith herself that she left because she deserves to take over the farm and you know like she like her husband is like no like you're not gonna do any she's like what like are you kidding okay bye um i love that about edith i love edith um and i love the relationship and i i like that there is because if you're in that situation like you're it's two desperate people forced together and if you've ever been on stage there are actors like that all the time where you think they're literally, I was in a, a, a version of Hamlet and I was Claudius and the speech where he sees Claudius praying and Hamlet like raises the dagger. The director later was like, I, I swear, I thought he was going to kill you, Alan. Like I thought he was just going to plunge the dagger into your back and you were going to be dead, like right on stage. Wow. So, there are crazy actors. Like anybody who's ever acted knows of those kind of people. Um, but when you're in like dire straits, like bonds are formed that, um, and I use the theater example again, like every time a, a play is over, people are always like, oh my gosh, we're just family. Like, oh, and they, everyone cries. I mean, I don't, but everyone else cries. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, like, oh my gosh, we'll, we'll, we'll be like, and you know, that's why there's so many stage romances and, you know, this, this kind of found family for a brief period of time. And then it, you know, once those like the, the forge of those stressful situations, um, I'm making a hand gesture, but y'all can't see it, um, mm -hmm. are, are gone that um you know it kind of it kind of dissipates and i think that's what's happening to edith and and tom in this situation is they've both lost someone um edith has lost her whole previous life tom tom has lost um maria and is trying not to lose his humanity and so when they're in that cage um yeah i think i mean i think the whole experience drives them together but tom is really trying not to be he's tom is the anti romantic hero you know, like he, after saving Edith and all this, he should sweep her up in his arms and, you know, like dip her and give her a long kiss where the music swells and the, and the camera, you know, zooms in. Like that is what he should be, but he, he won't do it. Like he's just like, it tries to, the music starts to swell and then it goes, oh, it just tapers off because <laughs> Finlan won't do the thing that the romantic hero is supposed to do. And um, so, yeah, I, I love the relationship. And to address really quickly, um, Johan, what he was saying about wanting more character work, uh, the next books are all about that. Like, it's all about 
exploring these characters um all of the like all of the the side characters that end up going with with Senlin we get so much more Adam and Valletta and and Edith and Iren and it's it's so good that's one of my favorite aspects of this series is how it explores these these characters uh, Sinlin's always boring. Everyone, everyone always thinks Sinlin's boring. Like, it, like I think a large part of, part of whether you like this book is whether or not you identify and connect with Sinlin. Because if you don't, he's all you have in this one. In the other ones, you have the rest of the the rest of the crew. So yeah, even like with Maria, all we know is through Sinlin's lens. We yeah, exactly. we never actually really have her voice in this. We have the flashbacks, and that's how we know her. That's pretty much. And when the artist tells the story of her and that's it right so she's never telling her own story so to speak mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah ben uh, your I, thoughts yeah i was gonna say in relation to edith but um i think another reason that i really love edith is because uh she kind of it, as the same way that adam is representative to a, a part of descendants journey but edith is as well in the sense of um both the shared trauma that brings them together but also the he leaves and he kind of has this further adventure and she kind of falls to the wayside of his brain and then when she returns it's a sense of like oh this this person's life still continues and the consequences of what we do together actively impacts them moving forward and i think that changes how he approaches other people uh because he really like that it's like when when he sees the arm and everything it's an example of like oh this person's life was severely affected as well um and I think it does a great job of uh, that that shared trauma and that experience then <clears throat> puts the basis for how Senlin uh, interacts with everyone else. That um, it, It's the, the way he views Adam, the sense that he needs to bring him along as well, that, that if he leaves people behind, they will suffer. Uh, and I think Edith is the kind of emblematic character for that journey for him. Well said, yeah. Johan, what do you think about Senlin and Edith before I think we'll move on to the baths after we finish talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much to add, but I really liked um, the, the character dyna dynamics. And I do agree with you uh, about in that scene where she is, um, we're, in the, we're in the cage together and stuff like we do get to see a bit more of the emotional side of Senlin um, in those scenes, which I do appreciate. So, but yeah, I, I agree with all of you guys about Cool. That well, I should let you go first then when we talk about the baths and the relationships we get there are interesting too. There's Taru we meet there mm. and eventually the artist and we meet kind of one of our big villains here, the commissioner and, and yes. the red hand. So what are your thoughts on yeah. the baths? So actually the baths was my favorite aspect um, of the whole book. Wow. Um, I really, is it called Taru? Is that how you pronounce his name? I think uh, that's how I'm pronouncing it, that's Alan. How Bancroft, that's how Bancroft pronounces it. It's true. All right, true. true. I think it's a French <laughs> name or, or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just loved how they become friends. And when you learn about how he keeps talking about he needs to go back to his wife. Oh. Uh, but but he's been there. Then you later on realize he's been there for, I don't know how many years, more than 10 years or something. And he's just really afraid to go back. And he's just been living this double life for 10 years. And it really just showed how complex he was, um, Taru. Um, I just love the whole aspect of the commissioner, the painting, um, and I loved how suddenly he just wanders around, goes to each hotel every day, and he just doesn't know what to do, and he just keeps trying on, he just, he just does the same thing again and again and again, and he hopes that suddenly um, the wife will appear, but obviously that's not how it pans out, but it also allows us to see that Thomas is quite driven. I mean, when he's given this task to steal this painting back, he's actually willing to do whatever it takes. And he knows the risks because he's been with Edith and she was, I mean, the consequences was absolutely dire for her, um, but he's still willing to do whatever it takes to actually find his wife back. So, but I just loved the, the whole thing there. Um, it was really great. That's that's awesome because most people, if when they don't like this book, the bats is what loses them. Um, really? so That's people like, oh, I loved, I loved the parlor and then it got to the baths and it's I a bit just... more grounded. I mean, the parlor is just so weird. Yeah. Like it's almost too weird. Yeah. Uh, while the baths is a bit more like, okay, I can actually follow what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the baths feel so purgatorial to me. It's just like, yeah. it just draws you in and it's like, you know what, what if we just stayed for a while? And as far as Senlin doing the same thing every day, like. I hated that. But at the same time, I'm like, hey, you know what? 
This is literally me every day when I get home from work saying that I'm going to, I'm going to film and edit a video today. And you know what I do? I sit on the couch because I'm tired and I don't want to film and edit a video today. And it's just like so indicative of our, let's do the same thing over and over again and not change anything and expect a different result. And I feel, I feel a little called out by Senlin in this, in this, this particular section, because I, <laughs> I do that. I do that all the time. Um, but I, I'm with I'm with Johan. I, I love the bath section and 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 Senlin. This to me is like I love Senlin. Give him some instructions and he'll do it. Like he yeah. just has. It's it's almost like executive dysfunction. Like he doesn't he doesn't have a clear path to what he's trying to do. But if you show him the path, like he can do it. He is driven. Like the whole he he's. The, the tower still continues to try to cast him as this as this romantic hero. Now he's the swashbuckling heister. You know, he's the burglar. He goes in and we see how terrible he is at artifice. He's an awful liar. The captain doesn't believe him like like at all um, because he's not a, he's not he's not who the tower wants him to be. He's not a huge liar. He's just a rube trying yeah. to bumble his way through. And so I love I love the bath and I love Taru. Like you said, Johan, um, I like his relationship with Taru. I like how Taru is this, you know, he's the, he's this bon vivant who is, um, he's like the guy of the bath. Like, oh, Taru, come have this and this. And he's like, oh, he's spending all this money. And then you realize he's just a scared, he's just a scared guy who's afraid to go back to the life that he's, that he's probably lost. And he doesn't want to face the consequences. And again, a little cold out, you know, like how often do we, do things and rationalize things to avoid accepting the responsibility. And so Bancroft just does a really like back the whole, the whole of the tower is just a mirror on the human race, right. On the human condition. Um, oh, true. Yeah. And so the bass just does such a good job with highlighting our running from responsibility uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I, I loved it. Yeah. I related to Hades in some way, you know, where you have people like Sisyphus pushing that rock up the hill again and again and again, doing it over and over or the poor guy, Tantalus trying to get to the grapes or whatever. And I feel like it's a metaphor for how good we are at deluding ourselves. Once again, you got Taru there. Who's pre he's pretending he's, he's, he's acting just as much as the people in the parlor, you know, on a daily, he's, and he's running away from his life. He's running away from his life. And how much do we do that in, in real life? Yeah. You know, how much do we run away from our lives and delude ourselves? It's it's a really potent metaphor, I think. Uh, ben, w w any thoughts on the bass? Yeah, I was well, I was going to say in relation to um, what we were saying with uh, the idea of uh, Taru, that I, I want to get, I feel like every single character, I'm kind of in the, the idea of this is Senlin if he wasn't Senlin. Um, that every person he kind of meets is a, like in terms of Adam, in terms of Taru, they are all, uh, possibilities of if he let his worst habits or worst instincts take control he could become those people mm -hmm. and as a result he has to meet them to understand that he can't do that um, and so uh, uh, the bass was um, I really enjoyed the bass I was going to say along the same kinds of, uh, uh, like, of as Alan that I did enjoy the idea that we see his idleness that that, that repetition and that uh, I the fact that he is just that once he's given a task, the entire book changes, like his perspective changes, the way he approaches everything. And I think it also keeps in line with him being quite a um, like the fact that he is a teacher, a, a book learned, um, a, like kind of exam based person. Uh, like you've got those that are um, like they're, they're given nothing, like a blank canvas and they can create from that. And then there are those that need to be given a task and they can execute it perfectly. And I think this does a great job of showing that uh, Senlin is someone that if you give him a task, if you give him an opportunity, he will do it 100% to the best of his ability. Yeah. He has to work within a framework. Um, I, he's not, he's not the, um, he can come up with a small based plan for, to execute someone else's idea or objective. I don't think he's quite the, this is my entire plan. This is everything has come from my brain. He is, um, I can execute and come up with very creative results for someone else's issue or uh, like objective. Yeah. Um, that I think is really interesting. Not, it's not something you often see in, in fantasy is um, that that is a, 
uh, a, a positive trait that this person is um, someone who is, if given an order, will do it perfectly. Yeah. And he nearly fails. He would have failed if it hadn't been for the jadedness of that one guard who was essentially like, all right, I'll give you two hours, you know, get out, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I do appreciate it. Go ahead, you appreciate that we do see some goodness in some of these characters, like the guard. He actually gave him two hours, and we do also see a kind of redemption for Taru at the very end, um, when when they come to collect his thefts, and he actually gives him self off so Sandler can continue on his on his mission. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting how we almost see more growth from the side characters in very few pages, and um, than we do from sure. Sandlin. Yeah. Um, what, a, what about our artist? Any thoughts on him and his demise? And do we do we believe that he did that painting or not? Because the commissioner later insists, oh, he's mm. a fraud. He didn't do the painting. It's much older. So the painting seems to be some kind of really sacred, important object. And that the artist, maybe he was lying. He was just trying, his, his, he was obsessed with it, trying to duplicate it. Uh, do we believe the painter is a bit of a fraud too, in that sense? I don't know if Alan is they, there. They've read the second uh, book, so they probably know. <laughs> He's kind of there. Oh, uh, sorry. I kn I know the answer, so I'm not. Oh, so you can't there. answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, fair mm. enough. I'm 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 going on the assumption that this painting has significance that goes way beyond the artist himself. Now, maybe he was a vessel or a vehicle for something or other, uh, but it's yeah. not something that he could have done on his own. I think. Uh, I don't know. What do you What do you think, Ben? Uh, I I would pass it off to Johan. Um, okay. You know, <laughs> it, it just, uh... <laughs> well, I, I've been trying to think about what is the painting? Why is it so important? Because even after he's able to collect it, it I mean, it pops up later on in, in the end of the book again. So yeah, I don't really know about the painter yeah. and all all about the painting, but it has but to have it's... something to do with the tower itself, which yeah. Sandlin is figuring out. Oh, it's a giant engine. Right, you've got. Yeah, that's what he, his, that was a cool moment. I mean, that was some, that was some really cool stuff that Bancroft was doing there. You've got these idiots in the basement going on the beer me go rounds to uh, send up some water, which becomes steam as people are burning the 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 hearths, the fireplaces in the parlor, which then goes up to the baths, heating up the water, which then go up to charge the uh, electricity up in New Babel. I, I, th I thought, okay, what is going on here? What is this thing? Yeah. It's like oh. the tower is almost like a human body and you have all these small organisms inside of it. Keeping yeah. It alive. Yeah. I, I love that so much. Uh, like it, it really uh, opens up the scope at the end of the book um, yeah. in terms of, because it, it, it simultaneously, we've, we've had a class structure through the entire thing. But it kind of hey, he's back. There he it is. kind of um it opens up an even larger hierarchical sense that um that there is this this sense of that even to the things that are made to be enjoyed are uh, uh, is being used for um the creation of something that they can't have um that that really illustrates the class divide throughout the tower um and I uh, uh like I think. The, the that revelation and the red hand together are both really great kind of question marks at the end of the book that makes you want to move forward and be like where what is happening where is this going in terms of how powerful and how uh, how kind of all encompassing this is yeah it's mm -hmm. going to get more steampunky i think with the uh with Edith's arm and you've got the red hand and, and he calls her a sister or something and then they're, they're getting this from the sphinx whatever that is so uh, and it has something to do with what the tower is as well i believe the the engine that sandlin is beginning to to have some intuition about alan what can you say about the tower itself at this point i mean I, I i'm assuming there's some big reveals that you can't talk about right i hope we do get some answers about what it what it is later on I can, you do get answers. So you're not okay. going to be, you're not going to be lost. Right. Um, I, I love that the, when I, when I found out the tower was an engine, like the fact that they, everything, like everything below powers what's above it. Um, and it all kind of like works together. It's, I think it's really cool. And I had so many, I had so many questions about like, um, how did Edith get her steam powered arm? And I think to talk about steampunk, steampunk is one of my favorite subgenres of fantasy, but I don't think it's ever like there hasn't been a seminal steam now steampunk work really that has like made steampunk you know take off like um you know like for for 
Flintlock, we have uh, the Powder Mage, which is a huge deal. Um, there hasn't been one of those really for steampunk because it's usually more of an aesthetic as like, instead of like actually being you, I think, I think the books of Babel do such a good job with the steampunk um, type, uh, I don't know, technology and everything. Uh, but freaking red hand shown. I hate red hand. And like, <laughs> I'm so glad Edith tossed him over the side. Um, I love Edith. Edith is, Edith is one of my, uh, is she is one of not only one of my favorite female characters in fantasy she's one of my favorite characters in fantasy period um edith edith is like bancroft's writing of edith and his writing of female characters anyway like as we're gonna see with irene and valetta and edith and uh, like it's it's so it's so good they feel so real none of this none of the standard tropes we have with and i and i like how edith like starts out that way it's like she's the damsel in distress and then we realize oh wait no she like ran the farm and she left because she didn't want to be nobody's kept woman. You know what I mean? And then, you know, Sinlin, they have that time and then she comes back and now she's BA and has this freaking sh- 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 po drop. Oh, I'm glad I have my whip. I'm back. so glad <laughs> your camera was back for that. <laughs> um, so I just, I, I love that. The, the section after the baths, the section of the foreman at the top. when Sinlin New Babel, went, New Babel. New Babel is my favorite um a part of the book i love just senlin's um assimilation into the into the the culture and his finding finding he's like i've got a plan i'm gonna steal an airship Hmm. are are you (laughs) how how are you going to do that senlin he's like i don't know but i'm gonna steal an airship and Hmm. you know what it's like he has a he has a goal and he bides his time and you know, people want to help him because he is kind to them. And I think Sinlin also, the same way, um, Ben, uh, you were saying that they represent Sinlin if a, a different version, if Sinlin had given in to his id or whatever. I think to them, Sinlin represents who they could have been if they hadn't have let the tower get to them. And that that like it always it like, gives me goosebumps every time I talk about it because I love people looking like you know what we can be better we don't have to take uh, we don't have to accept what this is like Senlin like let's go with that guy like you know what else do we have we've got this crap or we can roll the dice with him and I yeah. like that they believe in him even though he's a rube so well, I think it's because he believes in them and yes. he has this idea yeah. that yes you are my friend he like insists on it yes you are my friend we do have loyalty even though you betrayed me twice yeah and Iren threatens to punch him in the face and like turn him into paste repeatedly and he's like I'm not making fun of you like I'm not I'm not making fun of you like let's let, let, me, let me teach you how to read let me teach you how to read and I love it I love it yeah thoughts on that Johan or Ben yeah I mean one thing that I was I thought was quite fascinating is that he's willing to spend, I don't know how many months is he there? You would almost think there was a bigger sense of urgency, but it almost feels like he's starting to understand that if he wants to complete this mission, then he has to do the slow and steady way. He just, he can't rush it because otherwise he'll be caught in some kind of trap um, along the way. So I would just, if I was in that situation, I would probably think that my wife was probably dead or something and be probably act irrational, you know? Um, But it seems like he's, he's able to, be quite calm and just wait and actually try to complete it properly. It's quite um, plucky, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Ben? I always, um, well, actually, uh, yeah, I've, I've got a tangent to go on, but in terms of this, um, you, you when we were mentioning um, Edith and the um, the Red Hands, uh, I also, uh, I one of my things I appreciate about this book is, are the question marks it leaves at the end. Yeah. And I think uh, Edith's arm powering down and dropping the red hand is also a great question mark at the end of this book for which way is Edith going like what what how what is this arm and I think that question mark is also fantastic in in terms of just giving that lingering sense of I need to find out that I I think is perfect um but I do I do have a slight tangent to go on if that's okay go for Um, it to ask a theoretical (laughs) question which is um if Senlin did not have the tickets home stolen, do we think at some point he would have just gone home and hoped she was there? No. No? No. That's my boy. <laughs> You're going to ruin think, Alan's experience of the series. I think a point of the, the tickets are gone. That isn't an option for him. That leaves an interesting question of, 
if he had them and had been beaten this much, would there have been a part of him that would have convinced himself, she's there waiting for me, I need to go home. And I, I think there's an interesting theoretical yeah. question of whether, I think it leaves up to the audience, but I think the idea that they're, they're physically gone and not an option is a, mm. a, a big, uh, is an interesting one. Hmm. Johan, do you have a response to that, or? Yeah, um, that that is a, a very interesting thought. Um, I suppose maybe it is revealed, but do we ever get to know why Thomas is so confident that she is lost in the tower, and she hasn't gone home? Is that ever revealed in the book? Um, I mean, we know from the 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 painter guy. I think that, that possibility. Yeah. So when he meets the painter, I think it's he does think about that possibility, and it is kind of a form of torture. To think, am I going in the right direction? You know, and I think the moment he he finds the painter, that's a key development because yeah. that lets him know, okay, you are headed in the right direction. And then he keeps going like an arrow as as, as much as he can, you know. Yeah. But yeah, awesome. So, uh, any other thoughts about yeah. Yeah, Alan? You had to I have one. I have the sub press version of the of these books. Oh, that is so oh, cool! Wow, it's, it's it's amazing because this is note this is the bottom of the tower. Each subsequent one gives you another level of the tower, so it stacks up and makes the tower, which is freaking awesome. That uh, is awesome. And how were you able to get those? Um, my patrons, a bunch of friends of mine, like two years ago, pitched in and bought them for me and it is wow. the nicest thing anybody's ever done for me in my entire life and yeah, it's not those it, are worth because, a pretty penny <laughs> yeah because they're impossible to find but i wanted to because he was talking about the, the tickets not the tickets it comes with tower railroad oh, tickets, the first oh, book, so cool which is really really freaking cool that is so are, awesome these are the nicest books that i own um but i forgot that i had them because it's just i don't know i don't know i don't i don't read from them obviously <laughs> like i don't read from those be nice that is beautiful uh, yeah, there were it was it was like it's like 40 people pitched in and got them for me. So it was really, really nice. Wow. That is amazing. Wow. Thing, speaking of the tower, how I imagine it is it feels like that it's bigger on the inside than it is from the outside. Do you also get that impression? I yeah, mean it's big on the outside the too, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But it just feels like it's almost endless <laughs> when you're inside of it. Um, yeah, it has to be. Yeah. It's out of focus, but at least I know. You're there. I don't use a stupid camera because it focuses and then it like won't return focus right here, right here, camera, whatever. <laughs> people, are people are listening. I'm sure. It's better than being in the dark basement at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a figment of the tower. So <laughs> <laughs> now you're a ghost. Oh dear. Well, anything else about what happens up in the, uh, in new Babel guys, because mm. uh, that's kind of where a lot of the action happens. Fittingly, because it's the last portion of the book, so it's a kind of the most I've, I found it to be the most fast-paced part of the uh, the story, uh, where you have Senlin trying to work these two factions against each other, Rodian versus uh, Finn Gol. We get a bit of a glimpse into Finn Gol's humanity when we see his house, his family. Yeah, he has a family, and and the, his kids like Iron, and and there's there's a human there behind this gruff character who is so uh cynical like i think finn goal is is a good example of the cynicism that exists in the tower but he has this little tiny haven and guess what that doesn't work if you say to yourself i'm gonna have this tiny little haven for myself i'm gonna treat the rest of the world like crap and and use people and get ahead it just seems like such a barren enterprise, doesn't it? That he's had to isolate his family from everyone else in order to achieve that, I think. Yeah. yeah? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, that's what that's what I love about these books is Senlin's rep, like just Senlin representing like people. You can still be good, even if everyone around you sucks. Like you can still be a decent person. Um, and that's what I try to teach my my students is, you know, like people are going to, you're going to, you have to resist the opportunity to take advantage of everybody because that's how, that's the shortcut to getting ahead. It is. And everyone else is doing that. And it sucks when you're playing by the rules and they're not, you're going to get screwed over, but who you are is important and who you are matters. So mm -hmm. your character should, should trump, you know, worldly success or whatever. Um, and so seeing Finn, Finn having made that, that decision to be like, you know, like, his kid they, like they don't even know like they don't even know what a terrible person he is you know what i mean it's and but it also 
you also like understanding Adam, you understand why he, even if he wanted to, can't break out of it because then they'll have to live in the freaking basement or, you know, they'll get shunted down the tower or they'll get sold into Hoddom or, you know, whatever. Like he's got to keep playing the game. There's no way out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you guys also love how the, he gives, uh, Bancroft gives the commissioner his allergies and then he goes around with this gas mask on. <laughs> That's just so great. It's, it's uh, like, um, the uh, uh uh what's the guy in space balls uh the um not the darth vader but dark helmet yeah i felt like he's kind of a dark helmet kind of bad guy <laughs> with with his gas mask on all the time yeah yeah kind of i feel like um that that section really opened up Senlin being versatile uh like in the sense of um like beforehand he had his plan and he had to stick to it Whereas in this, he's just, like, this is the part where he's more open to things are going to go wrong and I'm just going to have to go with it because otherwise, like, and, and he does a great job of taking it rather than being taken advantage of, he becomes great at taking advantage of a plan going awry. Um, and I think that's like a, a pivotal change for him where he starts. Uh, but just not taking allow- advantage of people. No, exactly. He takes advantage of um, situations rather than uh, rather than the people um, that and, and say, for instance, the it's funny that when he kind of takes advantage of a situation, sometimes it's that he actively does good for people. And as a result, that is a situation that goes his way um, that, that I think is a great system of doing it. Um, yeah. Hmm. You could say that he takes advantage of Rodian and Gull by playing them off against each other, but do we feel sorry for them? <laughs> That's not enough. No. Those people have they've they've sac- they've they've made their choice. Too far gone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I suppose I... the only thing that really stood up to me in, in that section is that there's so much in this series that is unrealistic. But the fact that this plan takes, I don't know, four or five or six months to actually for him to uh, to be able to actually execute it, it just makes so much sense that he has to spend time on building these relationships off and to think about it and so on. Um, if he was only there for a week and he was able to pull this off, um, it wouldn't have felt as realistic. So yeah. I do appreciate that, um, yeah. that Bancroft left some time there for him to actually yeah, be able to think about this plan. Any other thoughts? Who is the girl in the painting? Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Of course, you can't answer that, Alan. And Ben, mm-hmm. you've read a little bit of ahead too, so maybe you can't answer either. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to answer purely from the sense of I won't say whether I know or not. I just think if I give an answer, it would let you know if I do or not, if you get what I mean. So I, I do. <laughs> just stay completely silent, even if I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So one thing that I thought we should also talk about is that are we supposed to care about Senlin and Maria as a couple because they're like there's no romance in this book even though they're on their honeymoon or at least that's my impression I didn't think there was much romance at all and and Thomas's love seems quite shallow in a lot of parts obviously he's very self-sacrificial and stuff like that um but we just don't get much insight into his thoughts and I think it happens in the flashbacks like in 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 retrospect yeah we we learn about their courtship and 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 Ben, I agree with you that there's something a little problematic about you know although he was not her teacher uh, at the time the courtship officially began yeah that's um, true. you know there's a dynamic there that is slightly problematic but it was also uh, kind of cute in some ways I guess you could see it that way um, <laughs> if you're willing to ignore the fact that he was her teacher. Uh, well, it also, I mean, the time period is also not like modern day. So, right, you know, right. So, that's a li- it, it is weird. Like, Philip and I are trying to say it's not weird. It's a little weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is, but funny. sorry, Ben, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say it's actually funny that um, I felt like Maya was so well done. Uh, like, in terms of that, I, I really felt like they did care for each other. Yeah. Um, that that I I actually fully believed in their their relationship in the sense of um like I I felt like there was a um like the the opposites combining like opposites attracting that uh like I that also sometimes you don't see it because it seems almost unbelievable that two people that are so opposite 
confine each other that some people avoid that because you don't want to alienate the audience be like that's not realistic but there is that there there is a chemistry involved in that they shouldn't work but that they do that i i, I don't know I, I i thought maya was one of my favorite characters in this book um yeah. the way she acted the kind of feistiness the um piano playing the, the fact that she is just like evidently when she reached the baths first off she's got through the parlor done second off she's in the bath and she is just like i'm gonna do what needs to be done and and she doesn't idle around like um like sending does she's pragmatic she's like i'm gonna get some money i'm gonna try to do stuff and, and uh her her kind of strong-willed personality was uh for me like a, a highlight um and and yeah if you, you just have to ignore the fact that there is an implied uh oddity um to, to put it politely in terms of um their their actual relationship um but i think it also the further i kind of go with it the more i think it's emblematic of the fact that stenling going to the tower is an awakening in the sense of that he wasn't perfect before and that the relationship with maya is a uh, has a flawed foundation um mm -hmm. in the sense of uh the, the power dynamic and that um I think I think the book does a good job of uh, of, of displaying. I I do think that it, I would be a lot more on board with because I I did have big big problems in book one in terms of the fact that it's never mentioned that um there is that that implied well a, a literal uh, student teacher but um because I I would have been on board I I do think one critique is that I think if at any point during this book even if it was in a um. Uh, kind of even if you had someone like uh, Taru or something be like oh you're with a younger girl type thing and and self-referentialize it even if it's in a negative way that would get I think that would incite the thought process in him to be like oh I maybe I hadn't thought about it just something would have helped me in the first book um, mm -hmm. but that that's that's my own personal preference I, I also loved their relationship um, other than the weird teacher thing. Um, I think they both, I think both of them don't feel like they fit in in Eyesore. I think they, um, Senlin thinks he's smarter than everybody else, um, which he, as he gets in the tower, realizes he is not. He is not. And um, and then Maria likes to have fun and doesn't want to fish. And, you know, she's, she's too vibrant for Eyesore. You know what I mean? She would not be an eyesore. She would be like a like a like a beautiful like Van Gogh painting, um, and so and I think that's what, being a painting too. Though. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think I think that's what that's what draws them together. And I think I think Senlin is drawn to her. And again, let's ignore the student teacher thing if we can. Um, he's drawn to her because she represents kind of like what he what he wishes he could do. He wishes he could like put himself out there the way she does. Like like he's terrified at the thought of like serenading the entire room. Um, you know, performing for an entire uh, gathering on piano. Like that's not Sinlin, but he wishes he could do that. He like, he, he does wish that he was more than this like stuffy academic wearing tweed. Um, he wants hey, to- Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I get that. Like I am, I, and, and my wife and I are very, very different. My wife is very- uh, extroverted she needs people she can't be in a, in a room by herself and despite the fact that I'm loud I like being alone like I like being in my house you know I don't like going out and stuff like that but I also wish I could put myself out there uh more so again I really connect with Senlin and um you know understand and so I was rooting for them but I absolutely understand what Johanna's saying is it, it is difficult to get invested if if you're not like like if you're not like me who just like is identifies both of them with me and my wife um i can see how there's not really like what is the impetus for him continuing to do this like why like y'all been married for like for a day time to go home like it's time to go home like what like what, what what are we doing what are we doing so um i do get that like and and that's not a that's not you know that's not that complaint isn't isn't just Johan's. Like I've heard plenty of people say, like, "Oh, like why do we give a crap about this?" Like I don't even understand them as a couple. So I I get it. And the worry is we don't know what's happening to her all this time. Yeah. And what is she becoming? Is she you know being forced into the relationship with this this aristocrat Pell guy? Um, 
that that is distressing to me to think that she's mm-hmm. essentially been kidnapped and and perhaps forced into another marriage. Uh, I'm I'm distressed just by the idea of it. I'm sure uh, for Senlin's sake as well. But um, it's it's interesting because I actually felt like as the book continued, my perception of the relationship between Senlin and Maria actually evolved. And I kept feeling like, oh, they actually do love each other. There is more here than I thought at first. There's a depth here that I didn't get. Um, you know, and as you get those, fly, like the kite flying and, and other things, him buying the piano, what a beautiful scene. Giving her the piano. He does love her. He he wants to make her happy. He, he gives her that piano. And I think you're right, at, um, Alan, that uh, she represents something that he can't do himself as well. And that's part of the attraction, but I think he loves her as, as a person as well. As well as he knows how to, like he, you know, he, yeah. that's the best he can do. Right. Right. Yeah. So, which may actually sort of increases my affection for him in a way um, because he is, you know, bumbling along as best he can. In, I in love that. Sinlin. I won't tolerate the book for Sinlin slander that everyone. <laughs> Like I won't, I won't stand. It. it makes me so mad. People are like, I kind of just want to read book four now and just skip book two and three. <laughs> the problem is people expect Senlin to be different than who he is in book four. And I'm like, you've read four books and you don't like, this is who Senlin is. Why are y'all still witching about it? Like when they didn't complain about it before, they complain about it in book four. I'm like, it's for the Senlin. I won't stand for it. I won't stand for it. I will stand for it now. But by the time we get to book four, I'm not going to stand for it. I will not, I will not stand for Senlin slander. We are forewarned then. We can get <laughs> final thoughts from anyone? Anything that we didn't cover? I'm sure there are a lot of things we didn't cover, but final thoughts from any of you? Adam sucks. Yeah. Valletta sucks. Edith <laughs> is awesome. Iran is awesome. Senlin is awesome. There you go. Why does Valletta suck? Valletta what? sucks. What? What? Wait. Okay. Oh, you're not gonna, ben, you're not gonna draw me into the 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 Valletta. Valletta. Valletta sucks currently. She's fine later. Okay. Oh. Hey, there's like Valletta. a bomb dropped here. At Valletta's the fine. She's Adam's the worst. Adam is the worst. I like Valletta better than Adam. Adam's the worst. Okay. All right. Fair enough. But I feel like he's 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 a victim as well. You know, and and he's he's physically. I mean, he's missing an eye. He's been branded, and he. It's all for concern for his sister. And but he, Philip, no one made him do that. No. Like, like he made his own choice. I understand why he made that choice, but like, yeah. no, it's fine. In this book, <laughs> Fenlin, Edith, Iran, Valletta, Adam, in this book. I'll rank it at the end of the next one. Um, I'll rank okay. it. That's Alan's power of Babel right there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Cool. Final thoughts, Ben? Uh, I uh, feel like if I had uh, just read book one, I um, may have been a little more tempered in terms of uh, my enjoyment. And I think that uh, overall, you just both have a lot to look forward to, is my general thought. But, um, cool. Book Oops. one was... Um... Oh, my camera turned off. Oh. <laughs> oh, we can hear you, though. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. We'll, we'll, it's a round table. We all lose vision at some point. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> my camera infected Johans. There we go. It's there contagious. There we go. I think, uh, right. yeah, in terms of the prose is electric. Um, and for someone who is an absolute prose snob, I will read whatever it is as long as I, like, just sentences make me feel good. And, and these sentences made me feel fantastic. Did we talk about that he is he was an English professor and a poetry professor? Like, he taught poetry and English at the university level. Like, he was a... Uh, he's, and he had a booktube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like Philip. So, I mean, that's I don't know what's going on with my camera. Sorry, guys. That's okay. We can hear you. Um, so, yeah, that's my kind of language, I guess. So, yeah, for sure. Um, Johan, uh, you're in the dark. You're in the basement um, now. Yes. <laughs> Alan is out. I um, elevated. I took Johan's train tickets. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll have oh, to use this camera. This so, your, your camera. <laughs> final thoughts on Senlin Ascents. So um, I, I went into this book with pretty high hopes. Um, and I think for the most part, I was, um, I enjoyed it. Um, it wasn't a five out of five stars, but I really enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to the next book. Um, and I will say that this is probably one of the best quest fantasy novellas, uh, or novels I've read um, in quite a long time. So yeah, definitely gives, I will give it a thumbs up for sure. And I'm really excited for 
what is called arm of this of the sphinx yeah arm of the sphinx uh, i feel like we've already been given some kind of i mean i'm thinking of either this arm at the moment but there's probably more to it than that i'm guessing mm. so but uh, all right well thank you excellent. very much book two is excellent book two is excellent what book is did, i'm gonna say a word ben zoo is that book is that okay just making sure i, I forget what, what what book things are in okay Okay, we're um, going to the we're going to the zoo. Apparently, <laughs> such an ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully next time uh, Grace will grace us with her presence as well. Hey. And sorry, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, you'll no. chase her away, Philip, or no. I'll chase her away with my puns. Yes, <laughs> with your uh, overly average puns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go to the library to study up on my puns. <laughs> nice. Oh. Mine's burned down, so if you can't come here. Oh no. And how many books do Vikings have in their libraries? <laughs> so oh well. Question. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody who is listening to this uh, somewhat chaotic but fun discussion of Sen Lenisens. And uh, we'll let you know where the next discussion will be on one of these channels, I'm sure. All right, everybody, till next time.